And I'm just going to announce a little troll I did, which is that this is my photo that I sent in. And it, like, it just looks like a really bad professional portrait. So you might think that I went to an actual professional place to get this done. That's not true. I kind of mentioned earlier that uh, I'm kind of weirdly obsessed with cruise ships for some reason. And so uh, Michael and I, I don't even know if you know these photos are in here, but you're going to love it. Uh, we like to, when we go on cruises, you, take, you do the photo package and get kind of drunk. And then you just go and take as many photos as you possibly can. And they come out amazing. Um, <laughs> And on this cruise, my parents came, and so we even got my dad in on the act. So he, I, I don't know how we got him to do that, but uh, actually, I do know how we got him to do that. Um, come on, Dad, it's a great idea. It's not embarrassing at all. Um, yeah, you got to get your inner cheese out sometimes, right? Just really let it, let it flow. You can't be all serious. Um, so I'm going to start out kind of just talking about the SAS team. Um, apparently, I'm not. Apparently, I misorganized my slides. That's going to come up in like four more slides. Professional. Um, well, let's talk about simple examples of SAS for people who haven't used it. Uh, this used to be a longer section, but um, SAS has kind of gotten a bit more popular that it seems kind of stupid to review the features of SAS. Sorry if you are here to learn SAS. The original title was going to be SAS 101, but then, yeah, I mean, Google it. It's not that hard. Um, that's my loving answer. Uh, yeah, so you know, SAS allows you to do things like use variables, um, use nesting, uh, kind of remove uh, limited nesting uh, in your style sheets. Basically, bring some of the programmer tools to you know the world of front end. It was the the first CSS preprocessor, and I think currently is the most popular. But I don't know. We, uh, Chris Coyier hasn't done a survey in a while. Um, so yeah, uh, and then we also have things like mixins, which are kind of ways to embed bits of CSS and other parts of things. Um, and then you know you can use this. And then when I call alert, alert, I can pass in variables and stuff. And then it embeds itself and repeats itself. Um, which, sorry, total side note that I wasn't even going to fully go over. Uh, some people, especially of the programmer persuasion, uh, were a little picky. And I am too. Um, and so uh, this repetition here. Uh, can bother the hell out of us, right? Like, I've definitely heard people be like, ah, why? No, you're, the code's happening more than once. OK, here's the weird part. I, at one point, tried to write a bytecode compiler for CSS, um, which I think they've been working on again. And I tried to figure out, OK, what's the smallest? Like, if I compiled this and I worked out all the rules, how small would it be? And I spent like three days just hardcore coding on this, right? Like, getting super intense. And then I like compared it to just the gzipped version of a regular CSS file and realized that actually the savings are like 1% um, because CSS is very, very repetitious and gzip is amazing. And it does a really great job of compressing all this stuff down. And the browser is actually super used, like they're super high end machines for parsing this stuff. Um, and so it's weird, like that this actually ends up being kind of efficient in the end, even for page render time. Obviously, there's limits, but you know, if you have nine megabytes of, of CSS, we need to talk. Um, anyhow, sorry, it was a side thing. Uh, hey, look, here's the SAS team slide. <laughs> That's where it is. Um, so first of all, uh, Natalie is the primary mad woman behind uh, SAS. She's written pretty much all the code. She's designed most of the features. And she kind of gets final say on what goes into the language. Um, years ago, I talked her into <laughs> helping with the project. And now she kind of is the. She kind of runs the Ruby version. Um, Chris Epstein, who did uh, Compass and Eyeglass, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, works at LinkedIn now doing uh, kind of their semi-sponsoring uh, some of what we're doing. He's the uh, crazy ideas guy, uh, or at least was traditionally, um, qu sometimes questionable. But uh, So he, he comes up with ideas, and Natalie usually says no. Um, that's kind of the way that they work on stuff. And then we've got Claudina. Uh, it's Miss CSS, who does uh, Oh, there should be an extra S there. Oh, anyhow. Um, uh, she does all of our conferences and events, community stuff. Gina's our head of design. Uh, Marcel Greeter does LibSAS stuff, and so does Zypher. And then there's me. Is that too early for that? Yeah. I'm just going to leave it up. You can all just cry to yourselves. Um, so that's the SAS team. Uh, I kind of started the project, but I don't really. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more. I'm a little bit more of a. Uh, I'm a Kickstarter, an ass kicker. 
Um, and that's kind of my role in the community. Uh, so quick history. So there's a language called Haml that I came up with forever ago. Um, I guess 2005, something like that. Um, and it's still pretty popular in certain areas, especially in the Ruby community. Um, and it's kind of like this. It's a way to do HTML that's a bit uh, more brief and a bit more structured. Um, it's funny, a lot of people uh, that hate Haml tend to think of it, OK, here's the, so like 50% of people hate this, and 50% are like, oh my gosh, it's exactly what I've always wanted. Um, and OK, my theory is the difference is people who hate it think that uh, the goal of the design was to limit characters or typing or something. Like I'm a super Vim user or something, and I'm just like, oh, less characters, every you know, thing should count. It's not actually that. Um, it was actually just designed to keep it, like when you looked at a big structured document, that the structure was clear. Because I felt like with just divs everywhere, especially before HTML5, that it was hard to understand that these were items and that this thing was inside of that thing. So I kind of wanted to build something that would give you a great overview of the structure of a page really, really quickly. And if you're used to looking at this, you can just glance at it and it totally makes sense. Um, if you're not used to it, it looks like a bunch of crazy shit, um, which is why I think some people hate it. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I think this was at RailsConf 2007. Yeah, that must have been it. Because um, it was 2007, as my next slide says. And uh, I grabbed Natalie, and I'd been working with a really talented designer who, you know, at this period, like, CSS was just starting to become a thing that might, like, a, a professional might spend any time thinking about. Before that, it was, like, somewhere between a designer and a programmer. Somebody would hack at it until something happened. The table layout would work. Like, that's kind of how um, it was. And there was just starting to be the, the movement of, like, OK, wait, actually, this front-end design matters. Like, and the, te the technology of the front-end actually matters. Um, and so I was working with this really talented guy who was just doing plain CSS. And he you know, would properly scope stuff using one or two layers. And you know, any time we would change, like, we'd be like, oh, yeah, we changed that to an ID, or whatever. Um, and then he'd start crying to himself with find and replace, going through all of the different files and his mega CSS single file, because back then there, it was really hard to concat. Like, that was weirdly a whole process you had to code yourself just to get one CSS file out of a lot of them. Um, so I kind of figured out, like, hey, we should probably help this guy out. Like, uh, this is sad. Like, we wouldn't, do, we wouldn't put up this in, in programming that you have to go find and replace everywhere, just any data change, basically. Um, so I convinced Natalie to, we kind of spec'd out the language, and uh, 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 it was actually on the plane ride home that she took my starting code and just started mailing it. I think by the time the plane landed, uh, she'd actually written a working uh, version. My version was kind of crap, but I'm not a good compiler writer. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a Haml sub-project for a really long time, and it was also the original syntax was only white space sensitive, because it was meant to be for Haml users, like, we just we're going to ship it with it, and people started using it. Um, and then Less came out, which Less originally was written in Ruby. A lot of people don't remember that. Um, and it kind of didn't get traction doing that, because people were like, oh, OK, it's just another thing. Um, they had a great innovation, though, of uh, they wanted to make the syntax look more like CSS, uh, which is definitely something we discussed, but we decided to go with, we thought Haml users held already in, like, was it in for a dollar, in for a pound, or in for a, Google it. Um, yeah, so the, and then the last guys ported it to JavaScript, which was a fantastic idea, because um, JavaScript was just taking off, I think, uh, less was 2009, um, and they had a, a, a more CSS-like syntax, which means new users, like if you're already a Haml user and you looked at the indented syntax, you're like, I get it, absolutely, this is high five, let's go, I know what I'm doing. Uh, if you weren't, if you were a CSS developer, you're like, what the hell, what is this, this doesn't look right. Um, so it was, they were totally, absolutely right. Um, so yeah, 2009, it was more CSS-y. Oh, I've already said all this stuff. Um, and then also a Stylus came out, which is kind of the, the third kid. It's uh, 2010, much more free form. Um, and basically with all this going on and SAS kind of being a side project, uh, we were kind of declared dead. Um, like basically people were just like, okay, that's that weird Ruby thing if you use Haml. Um, and we kind of went like, this is the way we kind of think of things. We were like, well, you know, it was a good idea to do CSS. That definitely helps, like, people understand, especially new users. It, you know, the fact that you can just take a CSS file and then it's valid is such a breakthrough. I can't believe we didn't think of that to start with, to be honest. So we kind of changed it to that because we thought it was a good idea. Uh, we made the official syntax kind of 
be more or less like by making it CSS compatible. It's funny how little code change that took, by the way. Uh, the addition of the SCSS syntax, um, was, I think it was less than a week of work, because it's really just how it parses. Everything behind it is all the same. So all the interpreter rules, all the compilation rules, all that stuff is all the same. So it was actually just kind of like a small, super small change for us. Um, and then, yeah, we were like, wait, this is actually really good. We should just do this. Um, yeah, you know, and we just kind of were like, well, whatever. Like, we don't care. We use this. Like, there's things about less that, I mean, less definitely got more popular than us by far. And uh, there were things that, like, the fact that kind of uh, mix-ins are the same as classes, I don't know, it makes me a little, eh. Um, and so we were like, you know, we're just going to keep working on this, whatever. Like, uh, and, you know, this is one of the things. It doesn't matter how slowly you go as long as you don't stop, something I said or Confucius said, but whatever, I'll take credit. Um, and so we, we always do steady, slow, deliberate, and debated expansions to the language. Um, that's something we're very, very proud of. Like, uh, some of the languages that never fully took off or have been having issues, a lot of times it's like, somebody's like, I've got a great idea, and they're like, that sounds reasonable. The pull request comes in, it gets merged, the language now is a new feature. That seems, like, that's how we do I don't know, a database or something, right? You're like, I had a new feature of the database. And everybody's like, high five, let's go. Um, languages are really not like that. Like, once other people are building on top of what you're doing, like, you're committed. <laughs> like, it's really hard. I think we've only deprecated, like, two things ever. And we gave it, like, three years of time with warnings and stuff. Um, kind of decisions we made that we were later like, ooh, that kind of put us in a corner. Um, especially with things that might conflict with new CSS features, we try really hard to not mess with the whole W3C doing their thing. Like, we kind of want to be to the side of it and be helpful um, with writing standards-based CSS. Um, and so this is really, really important. Um, I, have a, I have a mini play about that later, so look forward to that. Um, but, like, what were our weak points? We kind of had to, like, look uh, what was going on. I mean, I love this language still, but the fact we were based on Ruby was a big limiting uh, force because Less being written in JavaScript, even if you didn't use Node or anything like that, you could actually drop it into your browser and it would work. So for a demo or building something quickly, that was awesome. Um, also, it was the new cool language. And at this point, Ruby had just been eclipsed by kind of JavaScript as the cool language. Um, and, uh, you know, that became like installing, Ruby itself is like 200 megabytes just to install the interpreter. Like, that's a lot of overhead if you're, if you're going to your uh, IT guy and you're like, hey, yeah, I want to try this new thing. Um, yeah, well, when we install now, we need 200 extra megabytes, and all the systems need this installed, and all, all the compilation things. You have version management. Make sure that your gems are all like good. No, you should use Bundler. No vendor at first. Oh, wait, what? Sorry. And then they're like, nope, 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 nope. Um, we're not doing that. Um, so that was a liability, not because we don't love the language. I still write a lot of Ruby these days. But uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful language. But it's kind of not appropriate if you want somebody who's writing in .NET to use your language, right? Like, it kind of puts you into, like, well, man, I, my company's really got to get on this whole Ruby thing. Um, and then also, you know, uh, Ruby is not the fastest language out there. It's not the slowest, but it's definitely not the fastest. Uh, writing a compiler in a high-level language like Ruby, yeah, you know, it's easy to maintain, uh, which is good for us. Um, but speed was a big issue. So let's see, I think. Uh, I, I basically started coming up with, uh, I call it like my, my loving conspiracy. Um, it was my secret plot. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it was like in a positive way, right? You can have like a secret evil plot that's lovely. Um, and basically what I, my goal was is I knew that we had to deal with those two issues. Um, at the time, Natalie wasn't really interested in that. Uh, she's working full time uh, at Google. Like, you know, I like writing Ruby. Why would we ever take it off that? I'm doing this for free. Don't, don't make my life painful, too, is the whole thing. Like, don't make it so that if I add a new feature, I've got to go write in some language I don't want to write in. Um, and, you know, I basically decided, you know, Ruby, where we're going, we don't need Ruby. Um, and that's where I came up with the LibSAS project. Um, and uh, I announced it at the 2012 uh, RailsConf. Uh, and we'd actually been working on it for about a year before that. And the idea was, well, these were the goals. And then we got, kind of got to technical decisions after this, which is we want it to be easy to integrate. So I want somebody in .NET. I want somebody in Java. I want somebody in PHP. I want somebody in JavaScript to all be able to use this code evenly. 
And uh, there's a prod, or, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, no dependencies, nothing like installing something and it requires you to install something else. Like, uh -uh, nope, nope. Um, we wanted it to be, the language to be compatible. We want this thing to work, right? That's obviously having a, a second interpreter for language, it's kind of got to be compatible. It's kind of a bad idea if they're not. Um, and then the fourth, and by the way, these are in order of, what we, of, our, of importance and what we were working on, oh, is speed. Um, and so basically what we did is libsass is a static library, doesn't require any external dependencies. It's all written in C and C++. Uh, any computer with a basic compiler can compile it. And the cool part about C and C++ is pretty much every language allows you to embed that, um, ev like everything. Um, once you've written in C, which is not fun, this is not like a, hey, I've got a fun idea. Let's rewrite this very complicated compiler with a lot of rules that we've been building up over seven years of bug fixing and totally do it in a language where you can get a nil pointer error. Um, yeah, that, that none of us really know. Um, so you know, the idea though is with the static library is that you can build it straight into something else. Um, these are actually not the names, but these are what I was proposing at the time when I first kind of proposed this project. We'd actually had a beta when I announced this, um, but it, it was a lot of things it didn't do. Um, but the company I was at at the time <clears throat> was the CTO of MoveWeb, and in that capacity, uh, I got to convince the CEO that uh, I should have one of our developers who had a side hobby um, in compilers to start rewriting the whole thing in C. Um, and so they basically sponsored the first uh, six to nine months of development time. Um, and you know, it was slow starting. Like, it's what, like, it doesn't start out working. So it's kind of hard to be like, hey, why don't you come into a project that's quasi-functional and learn C, like, sorry, including the overlap of people who care about C++ and the people who write C is not, that Venn diagram is not very big. Like, there's not a lot of like, oh, I love front-end design and writing C. Um, it's not a thing. Uh, but, you know, we, we just kept working and working and working and working, and then eventually more and more people started coming on board. We started having um, more and more people use it. And at this point, uh, I think by far the bulk of people in the SaaS community are using LibSaaS, and a lot of them don't even know it. Uh, actually, last night uh, we were getting drinks, uh, and somebody was like, oh, I don't use LibSaaS, I use NodeSaaS. I was like, it's the same project. It's, we're, that's a wrapper around what we do. Um, and uh, it's now, as of last year, we made it an official project. So finally got Natalie and Chris to agree. It's now being uh, released in sequence with Ruby SaaS. Um, and also we announced that uh, we were gonna freeze development, uh, except for bug fixes on SaaS features. Um, think about the next big, you know, sorry, still the uh, spec work going on, but that we were gonna give it a year um, until we could get LibSAS kind of finish off the last things and really give us a little moment to catch up. Because if you go rewrite everything or add huge features, you know, we're a little further behind and we wanted to, to get things even so that it could really become a release for release uh, uh, project. And with 3.3 beta 3, um, I mean, I'm very happy to announce that uh, we are, for everything we know, <laughs> TM, sorry, uh, it, it is fully compatible. Um, according to, uh, I didn't even put a URL. But you can look up a SAS compatibility by Hugo. Uh, I can't say his last name. Um, Hugo. Uh, it's basically a whole site that just shows different versions of SAS and what things were added. So like here's an example. Ruby SAS 3.2 did this, but LibSAS 3.1 didn't cover this use case. Uh, I think right now there's only 3.2 uh, only has like three things on here that it didn't do. So now we're like, we finally got those three done. Um, and uh, you'll notice the versioning, uh, and this is always a little confusing to people as my badge just falls off. Um, we kind of started LibSAS, well, we started like 1.0, but we were, we're moving rapidly so that our versions will match. Um, so like 3.4, when that comes out, okay, this is hard to, think of it as like stable experimental releases. So 3.3 is we are, we are matching the behavior, or attempting to match the behavior of SAS 3.4 as a language but we're just, as soon as we call 3.4, that's it, we are locked in. We are now like, and really this is just a uh, emergency valve for us. If we put out 3.3 and we find some edge cases that we need to fix, uh, we wanna have an extra version so that we don't go like 
you know what I mean? It's a little insurance policy on the versioning, so we're not like, hey, we've totally matched, and then we find something we need to fix. Anyhow, nothing like talk of versioning. Uh, yeah, but that's going to be really exciting. And, uh, you know, uh, SASConf is coming up, and maybe 3.3, maybe we're timing a release for it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, libsass at this point, uh, I mean, every language has a wrapper, I think. I mean, I, I was looking at more. I was trying to figure out if I could find I get, Yeah, basic maybe doesn't have one. I don't know. I'm trying to think. Um, but yeah, it was funny. I didn't know if Erlang would, because who the hell's writing like web stuff in Erlang? It doesn't really seem like a good match, or at least not a build process. Or maybe. I don't know. Maybe somebody out here is like, fuck you. I use Erlang every day. Um, I love building websites with Erlang. But it was there. I found it. It's a whole project. So um, if you use Erlang, Libsass is there. Uh, which is really cool because now we've kind of, you know, this is going around the problem of not having JavaScript, right? Because uh, now we're in JavaScript in a way. Um, and so this is what's been super weird. And this is the first time I'm going to say this kind of phrase publicly because it's weird. But, you know, we really did think we were dead for a while there. But it's kind of weird that it seems like we've basically become the standard. That's a really weird thing to say about your stupid side project. Um, and it makes me uncomfortable, because I'm like, how many people are like, asshole, I'm like bragging. But it's weird. Um, I mean, we're proud of it. And you know, it's been a lot of work. Like, <laughs> it was eight years, seven years now of continuous work on this project. Um, and uh, yeah, it seems to have kind of worked, this development method. Um, so. The whole point of this talk is we're going to talk about the future of SAS, right? We've been talking a lot about the past, and describing kind of the current stuff. Um, so what is in our bright, bold future? Post-CSS, the future after SAS. Oh, that's, we're getting de declared dead again. Shit, what the hell, man? I thought we were done with this. Uh, and I say the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Um, which, by the way, he didn't actually say. Just, just throwing that out there. But I still put up the quote, because it's a better quote than what he actually said. So, um, no, so uh, post-CSS, I don't know if people are familiar here, uh, has been all the rage with the super JavaScript crowd. Um, and it's basically a JavaScript-based CSS parser that you can plug random stuff in and manipulate the CSS tree at will. Um, it's not a language. It's kind of a tool set where you can just throw in stuff. So rework, if you're familiar with that, is kind of similar. Um, and I, I think it's killer use case right now, uh, where there's no disagreement that it is totally awesome for this, is auto prefixer, uh, which in, in SAS land we used to use Compass for, but Compass is built in Ruby and slow as hell, so we don't really use it with libsass. Uh, auto prefixer plus you know, node sass, great combination these days, like, works great. Uh, helps you do all the vendor stuff. It's A plus, you should probably be using it. Um, and why, like, we can't do that in SAS right now. Like, in LibSAS, you can't automatically prefix, like, if you put in an attribute, or sorry, a property name, uh, you put it in. Um, like, we can do dynamic stuff, but I guess you could theoretically pull up. But it's, it's not pretty. Like, this would be kind of a weird thing to do in the language itself. Um, we, we can't do this post-processing stuff. Um, and it's because we don't make the parse tree available in our interface, so node SAS, we try to keep the interface simple, so we don't currently, we can't just like hand you all your CSS and let you manipulate it with uh, arbitrary code in JavaScript. Yet, I mean, I, we're going to. Um, I, I don't know what that means for anybody, but we're like, hey, that's a good idea. You should totally be able to do that. Like, we should have a JavaScript plugin that allows you to arbitrarily change it, you know, kind of later in the sequence of, of the parse. Um, and then one of the big things that uh, post-CSS has been, uh, I would say maybe some of their marketing is a, a little uh, nagging. Uh, uh, and they're, they're kind of mean about our speed with LoopSass, um, including they, they, they love this. Um, so you know, here's SAS, which we all admitted Ruby SAS was not a fast language. Um, so Ruby SAS is so slow that at LinkedIn, they basically had to build a computation cluster to compile their CSS, because they had like 100 people or something crazy writing SAS every day. And like they had all these crazy modules and stuff. And so it took like a serious amount of computational time, like an infrastructure. Not good. Not a thing we intended. But then again, honestly, we never built this language thinking that somebody would have 100 people writing it every day. Like that's not 
We weren't just like, oh, we've got a good side project idea. 100 people be writing it in the same office every day. Um, it just wasn't how we thought of it. Um, anyhow, I, as I mentioned earlier with goals, we never focused on speed. Like, we wrote it in C, LibSass is written in, in C, and uh, C++, um, and our goal was compatibility. Like, it was way faster. I mean, it destroys, like, SAS. It's way, way, way faster. And actually, I think if you really compare these to a larger project, LibSass is even better um, with performance. So if you have a large, pro large project and you're not, not using LibSass, Google your local wrapper. Um, because we're pretty solid now. Uh, but we just never even like, took 10 minutes on it. Like, our goal was compatibility. The problem that our users were having, we weren't having people who use LibSass go, oh, it's still too slow. They're actually like, yay. Um, their issue was that we wanted to have all the features, right? And so that has been the focus. Um, but you know, once somebody starts shit kicking, uh, Marcel Greeter got in 3.3. He just decided to take a couple days and do some obvious speed improvements, just some stuff we had. I think we were doing memory management kind of lazily cleaning it up only at the end. We were doing stuff that was a little slower than, than it could be. And so he, he did a pull request that got merged in. And so I re-ran their benchmarks, uh, which, oh, I didn't get pushed this yet. Because um, all you have to do is change, take the post-CSS benchmarks, point it to uh, our beta release, and run it again. And so these are the new, this is the first time anybody's seeing these, by the way. I mean, you can run them yourself, but nobody has. Uh, so yeah, we win. Um, not that this was a race we weren't even really that into, um, but whatever. So yeah, LibSass is pretty fast. Um, also, I'll note that uh, th this is PostCSS only doing two or three things. I think nesting um, can include variables and one other thing. Uh, it doesn't include their algorithms for extend or imports or anything else that we're also doing. Color math is not included in this, um, which is fine. Maybe you don't use that, but. I use a lot of color math when I'm writing this stuff. So we're kind of doing all of it, and yeah. Good work, Marcel. Um, uh, yeah, so fully feature complete. Star, I mean, hopefully. Uh, we're pretty sure. And yeah, it's stupid fast. And we're really happy with that. And you know, but like, OK. So you know, there's some people being like, uh, let's get rid of SAS now. It's dead or something. Um, and you know, like we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing. Like <laughs> I think it's funny. You almost as a project get mature. You're just like, yep, okay. Like sure. I don't know. You can switch off. You can switch on. We don't care. We're just gonna do the best job we can do. Um, I mean, I would say I'm a little worried about. I'm not sure it's the best engineering practice to build your own de facto. I use the word de facto a lot. Uh, self-constructed, different than everybody else's version of a preprocessor, like where if you went and used somebody else's computer and they'd installed an extra extension or if you used a different project, you might have a different version of how import works or something, uh, which is kind of the post-CSS model of you just kind of grab, you know, you can just replace how import works. Uh, I, I, I just say dragons, just, you know. Sometimes it's nice to be like, okay, we all agree that this is how it works, um, and that's why it's funny, like, being a weird pseudo standard, too. It's like weird tables have flipped. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, I mean, it worries me as a, like, CTO kind of guy. I'm like, eh. Like, Lisp is a lovely idea that you can build anything out of it. However, I'm assuming most people here are not currently building your own languages custom by Lisp modules at your job. Um, it's a little. And if you are, A plus, you're a better engineer than me. Um, so let me talk about Eyeglass real fast, which is a new, um, uh, SAS project. Um, it's actually a LinkedIn project. It's kind of not official at this point. It's an experimental idea. But the idea is basically to use NPM packages for SAS styles and extensions. So um, you can include something in your, your NPM pack, uh, package list, install it, and then in your SAS you can just import um, those modules and you don't have to actually you know, keep them in the same directory. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I would say I'm a little I use NPM, and I love the people who work there. They're good people. But there's, it's, it's a bit of a funky package manage, manager to me. Um, I'm used to Ruby gems where you can lock things and dependencies are resolved instead of just copied everywhere. Um, so I'm a little, I mean, this, uh, Chris Epstein's running this project. Um, I'm a little, I don't know if I want, like, we should go build our own or what. And I, definitely using NPM, most people in their front end build 
pipelines these days are using NPM, so obviously that's a pretty good match. Um, but yeah, that's my response. But, you know, have fun. Um, yeah, so uh, it works only with Node SAS, um, so the lib SAS wrapper. Um, and there's basically a quick search um, if you look up the keyword eyeglass module uh, on NPM, and you can look up anything you can include. Like, this basically works now. Um, so if you have a node, I mean, it's beta, so I don't know if, well, I'd say use it, why not, right? Um, uh, but it's basically things that, you know, you can do, like, um, like here's one, is you can uh, NPM install save dev spinners, which is a project, and they have a package file that they built that's kind of set up the way that iGloss needs it. And then you can basically just import it in your SAS files and then include spinner on any spinners. And magically, you've got pure CSS spinners, and you don't have to version the stuff or copy and paste it or do any annoying stuff. Um, I mean, that's a really simple um, example, but you kind of get the idea of this. We're, well, so one of the really interesting things with SAS that I think people don't uh, think of often is one of the weird things we do is allow stuff to not be output. So you can write a lot of helper functions, right? Like, uh, there, sorry, being that we're on the pre-compile time, right, that we are a compiler for CSS, um, if you include a library and only use one thing, then your impact on your CSS is only one thing. Um, if you tried to, there's definitely been talk where people say, oh, you know, you know, uh, SAS is, is, you know, maybe the W3C is going to add features. And this was actually our belief initially. I was like, this is crazy that CSS doesn't do some of this stuff, so clearly they're going to add it. Um, it's funny because the way the browser thinks is not the way a developer thinks. And it's probably not a good idea for the browser to have to download the entire spinners library with everything in it. Um, having a compile step really makes some sense, because you can have libraries and you can throw away what you don't need and you actually compile down to something much smaller. Um, and you know, it's, I think people tend to think of SAS tends to end up with bigger CSS, which in sometimes it absolutely can if you, you know, are having fun with life. Um, but what it also does is allow you to use stuff and not include it. <laughs> like, uh, have the powers of something, be able to bring in libraries, just like you would in almost any other language. And it doesn't have to be downloaded to every single user's computer. Um, so these kind of pre-steps make sense. Uh, currently, there aren't any plan the CSS working group isn't really thinking of that stuff right now. Uh, their main focus, um, and we work pretty closely with them, and their main focus is really what can you do in the browser. Um, and they're worried about extensibility of what can you do in the browser. Um, so for instance, uh, well, OK. I, does it, I don't even have slides for this. Here's a mini rant. Like, the way that we do layout on the web right now sucks. Like, it's terrible. Uh, it's totally the reason why the web was so good uh, originally. So the fact you could write uh, a header, two p tags, wrap it in HTML, set a color, walk away. When it went to somebody's machine, it was responsive. The first web was fully responsive. It could get this big, it could get that big. You could change font size sizes. Like it was so simple. The original concept of a page-based layout system made a ton of sense. Um, and it's why it took off. Like, totally, that was awesome. I don't think that that was a mistake. Um, but the way that we all develop these days is very, <laughs> is not like that. I mean, we're basically fighting with a page layout system with something that isn't a page. Um, we call it a web page, but it's not anymore. Uh, I mean, we, before they added a couple of features to CSS, you know, we all had to do table-based only. I mean, that's, I'm old enough that that was how I started on the web, was working with tables. Um, uh, I just leave up the spinner slide. Um, no, but we have to change this, right? We need alternate layout methods, absolutely. And, and you know, there's some things, like, it's funny, as the standards process has been trying to include alternate layout methods, um, I'm blanking on the name of it, what's it, uh, auto, sorry, but there's a one that's got some support, no? What? Flexbox, there you go. Flexbox, exactly, sorry. Um, Flexbox is kind of cool, but it's, it's weird that it came through a standards process, and for anybody who's tried to use Flexbox, it's a bit quirky. Um, it's maybe not the way that, like, it hasn't totally taken off everywhere. It's got some cool stuff, but, you know, we should be able to replace that at will. Like, your website should be able to decide, based on its design, what kind of layout system, like, and I'm, a, I'm a big fan of constraint-based design, uh, which I think will be the future of the web. See you, Vicky. Um, 
I'm a big fan of constraint-based design. Anybody who's done iOS stuff, uh, it's really, really powerful, and it makes way more sense for how we design apps these days. Um, yeah, so uh, what, they're worried, what they're trying to do is hook in JavaScript into CSS so you can use your own custom properties, things that only a browser can do. So the browser is responsible for the layout. So if you do this in JavaScript, that's where it makes sense. That's where this should be happening. Um, anyhow, so that's going to be a pretty exciting future. Um, and you know, we're always just going to be there helping you to write that code that ends up there. Um, here's my quick little thing on Natalie's design style, uh, which is SAS's design style, uh, which is think it through. Always, always, we don't rush on anything. Your pull request, if it changes functionality, will not get immediately accepted. Um, we always avoid ambiguity. Uh, we're really strict about this. If anything looks like it might be something else, we don't do it, or we find a different way to do it. That is like, if you ever go to the SAS issue tracker, if you're a serious SAS user, it's super interesting going there, because these conversations go on for years, where people were debating different things, uh, trying to figure out what's the most clear, what won't, vi like we're looking at the newest CSS specs that are proposals that probably won't be, t actually we've gotten bit by that a couple times. We kind of like avoided something because there was a spec and then that spec was abandoned and we're like, oh, we probably could have used that syntax then. Um, but never be ambiguous. That's the worst thing for a language. You need somebody else to go look at the code and go, oh, I get it. Uh, don't do it because the other kids do it. Uh, that's a big one, which this is my mini play. Uh, we, we, get, we get tickets like this all the time. It's crazy SAS can't do some feature that another language has. Natalie, it's being discussed here in some other thread. Uh, lots of issues to figure out first. <laughs> Cry, I'm switching to the other one. You, you guys suck. That's totally, people threaten all the time, like that's the worst thing they could do to us. Like, oh no, come back. Um, and so Natalie's like, all right. I mean, we haven't figured out all the issues and we're not going to build it till we have. Um, we're not sure it's a good idea or needed at all. Um, and then six months later, inevitably, that user is still using us. It's just like, hey, what about that? Um, in which case, we're like, go look at number 256. We're still discussing it. Um, yeah, so here's a, another quick, uh, right at the end, another, I call it a pre-pre-announcement. Uh, and this is where you'll see, especially with um, 3.5, uh, we're definitely going to include something along this. And this is a lot of, actually, the stuff I'm, I'm saying, I'm getting from, I went through and looked at the issues of what we all kind of agreed on uh, when discussing this, which is import is getting a makeover. Um, we start with a very simple import. You can only import SCSS files. Uh, it brings them directly in. Uh, there's no way to import once. There's no way to not import, like to say don't express your CSS, I just want your functions. Uh, there's, no, there's no module system. The namespace for variables is global uh, at this point, because you just write a variable in file A and somehow magically it ends up way over here. Um, and you know, that's, that's cool, it, works. it worked before, but I mean, as I mentioned, you know, Probably a lot of you are using SAS on big teams. And having this global namespace is not what we do in programming. Um, so these are the two issues, I think, that are most interesting, uh, 353 and uh, 1094. Uh, 1094 is like a summary of all the things that we're looking at right now uh, to go into 3.5. Um, but the, some of our goals are we want to do more parallel building. Um, we're pretty fast right now, but we'd really rather just go multi-core. So we need to know that a file, you know, when they depend on a different file, we need to know that information. Because if we compile one file, take that data, send it down to two, we can do those two, we can compile those two files at the same time. Um, which nobody's asking for, but I don't know, we, we're gonna build it. Uh, or we at least want the language to support it, how about that? The language should back this up. We might not build it in for, I mean, we're definitely not building that in. Uh, but the language itself will support that kind of thing. Uh, no more global variables, uh, they're gonna be gone. Uh, you can enable them if you like, so we don't blow up your shit. Um, but basically, if you go into a file, this is the current design, thinger.css, and you set my var to blue, then you say use thinger, and then thinger.myvar. Um, so you might, the way you'd probably do this is have, you know, like your vars folder. A lot of people have uh, all their color files or something like that, or something like that. You, you include that um, on most of your files when you need to use it. Um, and that way, our, our whole Compile tree will know that the first thing we need to do is go look at that var file because pretty much everybody uses it. Um, instead of using the kind of weird, fl like right now it's strange, we're actually re importing every single time you import like your var. If you import var file multiple times, it will be reprocessed. Uh, not ideal, but 
if it outputted CSS, it's supposed to go there. You're supposed to expect that if I, if I say import A, import B, import A, you would expect, like you might expect the output of A to show up. Um, and we're trying to get rid of that. Uh, we're definitely gonna do import once. This has been a long requested feature, especially for libraries. Um, we're gonna be announcing more at TaskConf 2015, which will be in Austin in November. Uh, so look out, if your users look out for Twitter, because we'll definitely be making more solid versions of, of what I'm saying here. But import is gonna be modular. Uh, I think we're gonna base it mostly off the Python model. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it's gonna be pretty similar. Um, and uh, yeah, I also wanna say, so WordSet, the, uh, the other project I'm working on, which is a collaborative open source dictionary. Um, we're doing a talk at 4.15 today in the emerging room uh, about that. So it's talking about linguistics. It's kind of a startup on learning about linguistics. I really actually think that you know, linguistics, while it's not something we're talking about right now very often, uh, is gonna be huge. Like this really matters to the next phase of the biggest technologies we're gonna be working with. I'm 100% convinced. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do it open and nice and happy and friendly and not all owned by Google. No offense, Google employees. Um, but yeah, that's what we'll be talking about. Um, so yeah, that's it, I guess. Yeah, we're out of time, so I was gonna take questions. This is, this is the Libsass development done, animated. And I was just gonna leave that up. So thanks for listening. Follow me at hcatlin. Please come to my talk later if you're around and you're interested. Uh, so thanks for listening to me babble.